everyone. Sorry, we were having some technical issues and I'm talking to Jonathan Greenblatt, who is the head of the Anti-Defamation League about the alarming increase of anti-Semitic uh, and hate crimes and anti-Semitic uh, symbols, uh, not only in this country, but in Europe. If it's okay with you, I'd like to start over because we're here to discuss the alarming rise in anti-Semitism in this country and in Europe, really all over the world. And you were saying that we were dealing with an unprecedented number of anti-Semitic incidents prior to October 7th. And you were telling me if these were different in nature than the ones we're seeing now. But So before we talk about the last three or four weeks, Jonathan, tell me what you were seeing prior to what happened so to this to ADL Israel had on October anti-Semitic incidents. We were seeing over the last recent years a massive increase in anti-Semitic incidents. So in 22 was the worst year we'd ever tracked. We had more than 500% increase over the past decade. Three times in the past five years, we've reached new highs. Acts of harassment, vandalism, and violence targeting Jewish individuals or institutions. That's everything from bullying in school to discrimination at work, to um, harassment on college campuses, to vandalism of synagogues, to assaults in broad daylight. People who are observably Jewish, like Orthodox people, people who are culturally Jewish and not you know, visibly identifiable. So all of this is germane because after, and by the way, where was that coming from? I think we've seen anti-Semitism normalized in recent years. Some of that comes from the political right, the language about the great replacement theory, the language about George Soros, the language about globalists. And secondly, it comes from the emboldenment of extremists, from Proud Boys to Oath Keepers to other terrible groups. I don't want to mention all their names. They have come into the political process, Katie. They've been kind of made welcome by certain leaders. Now, I'll also say what was happening was also the normalization of anti-Semitism from the hard left. We've seen issues on college campuses for years. We've seen the emergence of anti-Zionism as an idea and a more acceptable, quote unquote, political philosophy. Um, and that's been very manifest on campuses and in some other spaces, progressive spaces, let's say, as well. And then thirdly, Social media. Social media has amplified all of this, Kate, okay, and the internet's made, it's reduced the barriers to entry and made it much easier for startup hate groups, if you will. So in that environment, then October 7th happens. And October 7th is a savage, horrifying day of barbarism. I mean, again, I'm not going to go through the grisly details, but what was stunning was how it immediately, immediately, like within 24 hours, engendered a massive outpouring of pro-Hamas support here in the United States and subsequent anti-Semitism. So in the last two and a half weeks, compared to the same period of time last year, we saw a 388% spike in anti-Semitic incidents. I'm talking... And Chris, Chris, Chris Ray, the, the director of the FBI, testified and said it was at historic level. And why, what I think what's interesting, Jonathan, that you pointed out, it was sort of far right anti-Semitism primarily. And then October 7th happens. And what we're seeing really seems to be uh, happening in, in a, to a, a certain extent on college campuses. And I know that ADL has been monitoring anti-Semitism on college campuses. I've been obviously following this very carefully. What do you believe are the forces taking place in academia that are conspiring to create these feelings uh, among some people on college campuses? So I'll campuses answer that, that question, but I do want to say it is not only college campuses, right? We're seeing, like, again, vandalism has always been a thing, Katie, but now we're seeing people targeting, quote, Zionist businesses. So I'm not talking about the kosher supermarket, although that... Again, that's horrible. I'm right. talking about a restaurant that happens to be owned by Jewish people or a coffee shop that happens to be owned by Jewish people like or a furniture store. Like we're seeing this. Like when you spray free Palestine on a, again, on a, on a bakery, you're not helping the Palestinian people. I mean, you're not. You're, that's anti-Semitism, plain and simple. So now, now to, but to answer your question about the college campuses. So... 
I think the forces behind it are number one, anti-Zionism. So we've allowed in recent years this idea to take hold that just so we're clear, just so all your audience knows, Zionism is the idea that Jewish people have the right to self-determination in their ancestral home. That's it. It's this idea that like the state of Israel has a right to exist. It does not exclude Palestinians from that definition or people who are not Jewish from that definition. It is not an ethno-radical thing at all, whatsoever. And Israel has been the only democracy in the region for 75 years. Israeli, uh, you know, uh, Israeli Arabs, um, uh, Christian Israelis, everybody has the same rights as Jewish Israelis. That's how it works. It's a democracy, unlike all the other countries in the region. Now that's relevant because anti-Zionism is the idea that the Jewish state itself is illegitimate, that the Jews don't have the right to self-determination. It's not a two-state solution. It's not even a one-state solution. It is a final solution in that it says Zionism is evil. Zionism doesn't have the right to exist. And now for Jewish people who've been delegitimized throughout the ages, right? Ju- they used to say, Judy- I mean, the church used to say, Judaism isn't a real religion. And they use that to justify mass conversions and expulsions and inquisitions, etc. Then they said, okay, well, Judaism could be an okay religion, but Jewish people aren't a real race. And that was used to just, I mean, eugenics justified that. And that's how Hitler created the conditions in which he annihilated 6 million. And then after the Holocaust, they said, okay, Judaism could be a real religion, Jews can be a real people, but the Jewish state isn't real. The Jewish state isn't legitimate. And it's the same old myths and tropes. And yet, a lot of us believe, including me, in that the Palestinian people have the right to self-determination too, and that there should be a two-state solution. But that's not what anti-Zionism says. And so... Well, let's talk about, well, let's talk about Zionism, Jonathan. How has that been co-opted both by extremes on sure. both sides. Can you talk about that? Because yeah, I, mean, I do I feel think, like it has been. Look, Zionism, again, is the idea that Israel has the right to exist like America has the right to exist. Now, you may feel very strongly about, for better or for worse, about President Biden, or let's say President Trump. President Trump certainly evokes strong feelings. And there are a lot of people who are, say, very virulent fans, and not so much. But no one would say America doesn't have the right to exist. And some would say, that, you know, the MAGA movement co-opted the use of the American flag. But no one would say only they get to use the flag. And so I think there are people who've tried to not say we don't like Bibi Netanyahu's policies, or we don't agree with the way that Israel's pursuing a peace process. But they've said, no, no, it's not about the politics. It's not about the policy. It's the fact that this country exists at all. That's our problem. And when, so when you get to it, it's not, again, we don't like Trump. It's that America doesn't have the right to exist. Or you don't like Russia, right? And you don't like their policies, but you don't say the country doesn't have the right to exist. It should be broken up and destroyed. So that's where we are today with Israel specifically and Zionism. So again, we might not like all the policies of certain governments, but to say that the government doesn't have the right to exist and that Israelis don't have the right to exist, that may sound very like theoretical and abstract, but it's actually an idea with consequences. And so what are the consequences? Well, since the mass, I mean, I would say to you, the reason why people can go into a, into a kibbutz, which is like a little like farming community and go house to house and execute children in front of their parents and rape mothers and rape grandmothers and kill them all is because they dehumanize them because they're not really people, Katie, they're Zionists, right? They're enemies. And so then on campuses, how do you have a situation like at the Cooper Union last week, where there was a mob of anti-Israel protesters and the campus security had several Jewish students who they worried they couldn't keep safe. So you could just ask yourself, how can that be to begin with? But They took these Jewish students and they barricaded them in the library and locked the doors. Security did that. And the mob outside, there were windows, big windows. They saw these kids and they banged on the windows and they said, it globalized the intifada. 
Now, for your viewers who don't know, the Intifada was a series of violent terror actions committed against Israel in the early 2000s. They blew up buses, suicide bombers in restaurants. It's horrible. Globalize the Intifada is not a nice way of saying two-state solution. It's a way of justifying violence. And by the way, these kids in that, this is very important. The kids in the library, Katie, they weren't holding signs that said, we love Bibi. They were simply had kippahs on their head and they were visibly Jewish. And that made him a target of the mob. And I'll use one other example. So last week also at GW University, so students from, from a group broadcasted messages on the exterior wall of buildings that said, Palestine will be free from the river to the sea and glory to the martyrs. Now, maybe in a different context, these slogans would be fine, but Palestine will be free from the river to the sea is a call for ethnic cleansing. It is not, again, a two-state solution. It is not even a one-state solution. It is Palestine with no Jews from the river to the sea. That's what it means. It's a Hamas slogan. Like, that's where it comes from. The kids didn't invent it. And glory to our martyrs is a phrase that they started using on October the 7th to, whatever you want to say, uh, celebrate the people who committed the massacre. So in a different context, such slogans might be innocuous. But what we see happening on these campuses, Katie, is you have these slogans, you have these demonstrations, and then Jewish students are not just physically intimidated, but they end up getting assaulted. They end up getting threatened. At Cornell on Sunday, you know, there were messages posted to the student discussion board saying, if I, you know, I'm going to go shoot up the kosher dining hall. If I see a Jewish woman, I will lure her away and rape her. If I see a Jewish man, I'm going to slit his throat. And we've seen bizarrely, bewilderingly, in the, in the face of this, college presidents and university administrators have equivocated and not simply, quickly, clearly, consistently called this out. Said, well, it's political. We worry about everyone. All lives matter. Like, there's a time for those messages, but not when your Jewish students are being told, are being told that they are going to be killed. Not when they're getting assaulted right off campus, as happened to Tulane. Not when their dorm rooms are getting set on fire, as happened to Drexel. I, I mean, I could literally go on with story after story after story. It's just terrifying. Well, we know it's happening, but I want to go back to my original question or my earlier question, Jonathan. What are the forces that are conspiring to create this really quite dramatic shift, a generational shift? And obviously, college students are not a monolith and they're, they make, they're made up of a lot of people. But what has changed and what 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 is what are the forces that are coming together that are creating this? And yeah. I, I'm sure you've given this some thought and talked to people so about it. What are you coming up with? Number one, we've allowed, again, this notion of anti-Zionism to be normalized as if it was a legitimate, you know, political project instead of talking about what it is, like a, court, a kind of final solution. I think, secondly, extremists feel very emboldened in this moment, right? So when... It, I've had Jewish students say to me before October the 7th, Katie, that they're afraid to go to Hillel. For those who don't know, Hillel is the Jewish center at college campuses. It's where kids go for like a Shabbat dinner or maybe go to learn a Hebrew or something. And I've had students say to me that the social justice movement on campus says that Hillel is part of the Israeli war machine. The idea that Hillel is part of the Israeli war machine you know, good luck to Israel if that's the case, because, you know, Lord knows you don't go to Hillel to learn hand-to-hand -hand combat. But that kind of messaging, so extremists, and I think this reflects the broader discourse, Katie, where extremists feel emboldened in lots of ways today. We're in a very de-institutional moment. People don't trust institutions. People don't trust the news media. They don't trust government. They don't trust, you know, big business. And in a de-institutional moment, when things are unraveling, um, it allows extremists to get under the hood and say, I'm going to tear everything down. I think that's happening here too. And I will say that I think the, the progressive left, and by the way, full disclosure, I worked for President Obama in the West Wing. I worked for President Clinton. You know, you, you, you didn't, I mean, no one, would, no one would think, you know, that I'm a regular on Fox News. But the kind of co-opting of the left 
with this kind of hateful messaging, this sort of cancel culture idea that Jews don't count, that Jews are all white and privileged and therefore part of some bigger problem, I think has got a lot to do with this too. So I think the ideas at the root of what is diversity, what is social justice, have been corrupted in a way so that Jewish people are seen as um, the oppressors. The oppressors, they're seen as oppressors, they're seen as colonizers, they're seen to kind of fit into this vernacular. I wanna read a quote from Peter Hamby, who wrote an article about this for Puck. He wrote, quote, over the last few weeks, the commentary about Israel has been infected by America's new political vocabulary and algorithms that mm -hmm. tell people how to think and what to say. Words like genocide and war crimes are being casually tossed around in comment sections, usually with little consideration for the actual genocide in Europe that led to the creation of the Jewish state in the first place. Campuses have emerged as a primary battleground. Universities and colleges everywhere have exploded with demonstrations with chants of free Palestine competing with vigils for dead Jews and accusations of anti-Semitism from pro-Israel students. So yes. um, I'm just curious to get your comment because clearly social media is is putting this hate on you know on steroids and the force of of misinformation and how the algorithms are programmed or work are only fueling the hate. I think you're now something really important. It. I think we've seen these like these buzzwords like decolonization or settler colonialism or words that I think the young people repeating them don't even know what they mean anymore. Um, you know, and there's this crazy kind of, again, cancel culture on campuses where you say anything that is somewhat off, you get canceled. And in that world, white Jewish people, again, are seen as the oppressors. And this narrative has taken hold of somehow Israel is a white country. I mean, tell that to my brown skin relatives there. I mean, it's such a, it's such a silly thing. We try to see the world we try to say the world is our, our racial problems and project them on a world where they don't fit. Like Jewish people, there are more people of color in Israel than there are white people. I mean, Jews, because most Jews don't come from Europe. They come from the Middle East. They come from parts of Africa, like my dark skinned wife. I mean, these conversations are so insane, but this kind of, you know, the psychology has descended upon these campuses and calcified. And these kids are trapped in this, this no man's land of nonsensical ideas. So I do think, and by the way, it then moves off campus. So one of the most disturbing things, Katie, was seeing Black Lives Matter chapters celebrate the massacre. In Chicago, the Black Lives, and in DC, the Black Lives Matter chapter published on, on social media images of paragliders to you know, to evoke the people, the Hamas terrorists who flew in paragliders and murdered all those kids at the concert. And they said glory to the martyrs and things like that. I, I mean, I can't begin to imagine how twisted it is that the BLM movement or some of its chapters have been co-opted and captured by people who celebrate the slaughter of babies. I mean, it's just sick. And again, trying to project the complex racial issues in this country on Israel or any other place is foolish, it's stupid, but it's also dangerous as we're seeing right now. I'm gonna to talk to you about sort of the, what is happening in Gaza right now in a moment, but we've got a lot of questions on social media, Jonathan, about what is being done to protect Jewish students on college campuses. And as you answer that, can you tell us some of the things you're hearing directly from so, you know, young J Jewish people uh, who are experiencing this heightened yeah, level of anti-Semitism. So the level of, I've never seen Jewish college kids more alarmed. I'm hearing from them every single day. I had a session yesterday here in LA and a young woman who just graduated from Penn, she was on the screen, she almost started crying basically, saying she's losing friends because they're telling her she's a baby killer. I, I, I mean, she's a 22 year old from California who just happens to be Jewish. To call her a baby killer or whatever is beyond insane. But I'm hearing this in many places and it's really disturbing. Um, lots of Jewish, there was a press conference yesterday at Columbia University where Jewish kids said, we don't feel safe on our campus here at Columbia. 
There was a student at Yale University who wrote an op-ed about the situation, and the op-ed was was severely uh, edited and dro then dropped by the paper without telling, without explaining, because they're unwilling to publish the Jewish student's point of view. So the level of, of groupthink on these campuses, it's insane, and it's, it's, it's endangering these students, and they know it, and they're worried. Now, on the other hand, I will also say, Katie, I've never seen Jewish people more unified. I've never, in my eight years on the job, seen the Jewish community more lockstep. Now, there are some Jews on the far left who are anti-Zionist, and there are some Jews on the far right who are just pro-MAGA. That's certainly true. But the vast majority of Jews today are not talking right or left. They're only talking about their brothers and sisters in Israel. But there mm -hmm. are a lot of Jewish people, just as there are in yes, totally. Israel. Because Israel was very divided before this, Jonathan, about Benjamin Netanyahu's policies and his policies of, you know, trying to embolden Hamas so a two-state solution couldn't work and pitting the Palestinian Authority against Hamas. I mean, there's been a lot documented about Benjamin Netanyahu's policies. So there are a lot of Jewish people, both in yeah. this country and in Israel, who are sickened by the, the, the military action and the killing of civilians in Gaza. So I'm curious to get your take on that because many Jewish voices are speaking out uh, uh, for peace and Palestinian freedom. So it's, it's not black and white, even though it's well, easier to kind of see look, things that like way in today's Israel culture. is a robust democracy and the Jewish people are a raucous people. And so there are, you know, the expression, two Jews, three opinions. I think it's very true that Jews have a wide range of views on Israel. And indeed, the country, there was Bibi Netanyahu, Bibi Netanyahu was an incredibly unpopular prime minister. There were massive protests against him, you know, over the last, whatever it's been, nine or ten months before October the 7th. People didn't like yes. him because he was indicted and because of his policies. And it was the most right thing. He was yeah. trying to reduce yeah. the power of the judiciary. Yeah. He had yeah. all these it's right wing, the most right -wing government in the country's government. 75 year history. He was trying to literally change the judicial framework. Uh, all very problematic. Now, that being said, um, look, I, I got to say, like, I, I mean, I don't want to comment on my personal feelings of Bibi Netanyahu, but I didn't agree with the direction, political or policy direction that the country was moving in. Um, and by the way, I'm also someone who has been a vocal advocate for a two-state solution. Like, I'm someone who has been vocal and gotten a lot of criticism. I mean, you certainly can't negotiate with Hamas and tough to negotiate even with the PA and the West Bank. But look, we, the Israelis will not only have true long-term peace when they have safety and security in Israel, and Palestinians have equality and dignity in a country or a state or an entity of their own, whatever you want to call it. Now, that being said, um, I do think it's fair to say that being pro-Palestinian doesn't mean you're pro-Hamas. I think I'm pro-Palestinian, and I am anti-Hamas. And I know there are many Palestinians who are anti-Hamas, but Katie, I do need to say we need to hear from them as well. You heard from lots of Jews who didn't like Bibi Netanyahu, lots and lots and lots, but I don't know that we're hearing lots and lots from Palestinians who say, you know what? We don't like Hamas. What Hamas is doing is terrible. I mean, I just don't hear those voices. We need to hear more of those voices. At the end of the day, I think the innocent lives lost in this country, like the Palestinian boy who was a six-year-old boy who was stabbed and killed in, um, in uh, Chicago, outside Chicago in Illinois, is a tragedy. And the idea that anti-Muslim bias is increasing is a tragedy. And the idea that innocent lives are being lost in Gaza is a tragedy. But ultimately, Israel, Palestinian equality and dignity also means Israeli safety and security. And to have a government on its border that's not just committed to destroying the Jewish state, as Hamas says, that's not just committed to murdering Jews, as it says in their charter, but literally goes out and murders them. It doesn't leave Israel a whole lot of choice. I'm, I'm curious in an effort to, to root out Hamas though, Israel, 
Israeli forces, as you know, and you're watching this, Jonathan, they've killed scores of Palestinians and anger over civilian casualties, nearly 8,800 deaths, according to the Gaza Health yeah. Ministry, which is run by Hamas. And so people have been skeptical about the exact numbers, but clearly there has been a lot of carnage, Jonathan. And, 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 and how concerned are you that this will fuel even more anti uh, anti-Israeli and anti-Semitic well, sentiment. Yeah. Uh, someone wrote in, I'm just going to just mention one thing before you answer. Someone wrote in, I support Israel, but what do I say when they bomb a refugee camp? That is indefensible to me. So how concerned are you about the retaliatory action that Israel's taking? Uh, certainly many would say they have a right to defend themselves. But the massive numbers of children and families that are being killed is, as this viewer I mean, wrote, indefensible. I think this started with Hamas and this needs to end with Hamas. If Hamas released a hostage, Katie, Israel wouldn't drop another bomb. Like before we talk, I mean, we, it's good to talk about the ceasefire. When you talk about Hamas surrendering, Hamas could end this. Hamas started this, they could end this. Like every life lost a tragedy. And I don't know the specifics of the bombing of the refugee camp, but Hamas puts their command centers in hospitals and underneath schools and mosques. Like, it's terrible that Israel has to bomb. It's terrible that Israel has to be these big explosives to take out the tunnels. But it's terrible that Hamas is hoarding fuel and food and supplies from their own people. And it's terrible that Hamas in, literally enmeshes itself underneath the civilian infrastructure. And it's terrible that Hamas doesn't say, I don't know if you saw what... Um, their spokesperson said yesterday on Arab media, he said, we're going to do October 7th again and again and again. I mean, I just feel like, look, yes, it's a tragedy that civilians are getting killed. And when someone says, like, why is Israel doing this? The question is, why did Hamas, why doesn't Hamas just surrender and save their own people? Why doesn't Hamas, like, give up the hostages and protect their own children? Why does Hamas not actually say, let's negotiate a long-term peace with the country right on their border. Like, look, I, I just want to say, robbing the, expecting everything from Israel robs the Palestinians of their own humanity. It denies Palestinians their own agency. And I just think that's really, not only is it wrong, it will never, ever, ever end this conflict if we think it's only about what Israel does. I know you have to go in a couple of minutes but do you are you seeing a generational shift a gallup poll earlier this year before the war found that for the first time in more than 20 years more democrats sympathize with palestinians than israelis driven in large part by the younger demographics of the party's membership do you think this represents a permanent sea change in know. the democratic I mean, I think party it's a good question to ask i think look 30 years ago the republican party wasn't very pro-israel if you remember there were a lot of leaders like Pat Buchanan and others who were decidedly talked about the Israeli choir, if you will, or the Jewish choir in Congress. And there was a lot of un-Israel opinions there, I would say. And I point this out, Katie, to only say that politics change, attitudes change. We do see strong bipartisan support for Israel at the elect in elected office at all levels. And you're right, we do see a lot of different opinions among young people. But as we just talked about it a minute ago, I think these college campuses have been co-opted. I think as more facts come out, I think as people learn more, you realize that the world is more complicated than you learn from a placard or from a TikTok video. But now this is really the gist of it, which is why I'm so excited to do this Instagram Live with you. And because I think to tell our stories, we can't just rely on CNN or the New York Times. We need Instagram Live and personalities like you we need TikTok. We need talking to social media because that's where young people are getting their information today. Look, I, um, sure. Are you okay sure. for a couple more sure. questions, Jonathan? I want to be mindful of your schedule. Um, you know, someone asked, uh, many of my followers said, can you be anti-Israel and criticize its policies and its leadership without being anti-Semitic? That's a question I wanted to ask Doug Emhoff when I interviewed him at the Aspen Ideas Festival and I, I, you know, I didn't have time to do that, but that's a, that's an interesting, an Look. interesting question.
And and I I imagine you would say like, yes. You can criticize Israel. You if you want an example of an organization that criticizes Israel and is not anti-Semitic, I'm going to suggest a website for your viewers, Katie. They should write this down. Write this down, everyone. It's a long one. ADL.org. That's ADL.org. That's my website. Like, we've taken issues with plenty of Israeli policies over the years. We don't agree, and I don't need to enumerate them, but I don't hesitate to call it out. But yet, I don't question the country's right to exist. I may question, again, policies. I may question politicians. Um, but that doesn't mean I question its principle. It's like its core founding principle of existence. So you can definitely criticize Israel without being anti-Semitic. And let me say something else. This idea that people say, well, I can't criticize Israel because then everyone says I'm anti-Semitic. That is not true. You can criticize Israel without calling for ethnic cleansing of Israelis. You can criticize Israel without suggesting that the country is so structurally flawed that it should be torn down. I mean, you can criticize Israel without glorifying the people who butcher and burn and maim and mutilate its citizens. Like, it's actually not hard. And I'll make one more point. So I think that's a red, red herring by people who want to shut down the conversation. No, I can't criticize Israel because then they say I'm anti-Semitic. That's not true. Secondly, I also think people say, well, I can't talk about Israel because then I get canceled. Like, Katie, is there a topic of conversation more debated in foreign policy, more debated and discussed than Israel? Is there? Like, I mean, I think people talk more about Israel than they do Ukraine, than they do China, than they do like almost any other issue out there. So I think, yes, you can criticize Israel. Yes, you can question its policies without being anti-Semitic. And at the same time, at the same time, very often when you demonize the country, when you delegitimize the state, when you hold it to double standards, that's when your own animus when your own anti-Semitism tends to show. In closing, uh -oh. a friend of mine asked me to ask you, and she's very distressed about the increase in anti-Semitism. I think a lot of people, needless to say, Captain Obvious, are really incredibly upset and distraught about what they're seeing unfold. And her question was very simple. Good question. What can be done about it? In some ways, that's the hardest question. So look, I think number one, what can be done about it is, first of all, leaders need to lead. President Biden has demonstrated more moral clarity and rock solid leadership in the past three weeks than maybe ever in his political career. Like he called out the massacre for what it was. He went to Israel in a time of need. He has been unshakable. And by the way, Hakeem Jeffries and Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell and the, what's the new guy's name, Mike Johnson, have all, and the R's and the D's have all been very good on this. University presidents, Katie, have been terrible. Like, again, and there's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with saying that the tragedies and the tragedy of, life, of a loss of life in Gaza is terrible. There's something profoundly wrong when you feel the need, they say, I can't say anything about what's happening in the murder of those people in Israel because of now it's happening in Gaza. And I hear that a lot. Or I hear, you know, I need to, I need to both sides this issue. There's no both sides. There's no both sides to rape and torture. That's, e that's not right versus wrong. That's good versus evil. So what can people do? Number one, our leaders need to lead. President of the United States, University President, President of PTA. Number two, people need to speak up and feel empowered to do that. And so if you're a donor to a university that isn't protecting your, you know, your kids or your grandkids, don't send them your regular check. Send them a $1 check and write a letter and explain why. Don't just stop giving. You need to give $1 with a letter and say, this is why you're only getting $1, and then you'll get a call back. Or organize your other alumni, organize your other donors, organize your other trustees. If you don't like what the campus is doing, that you're part of that community, speak out. If you're at a company and the DEI training at the company doesn't include anti-Semitism, raise your hand and speak out. Um, if you are in a, church or in a house of worship and you want to do something invite jewish people to your you know your religious institution right and create some joint programming um you know and by the way if you're an employer like don't hire college graduates when their social media are saying they want to kill jews like that is 
isn't okay. Katie, we've talked before. I don't believe in cancel culture. I believe in council culture. But, but when you threaten people's lives, when you glorify rape and murder, you don't need council culture, Katie. You need consequence culture, consequences to show that this is not okay. How can we build bridges? You talk about repercussions for bad behavior, but I'm just curious, Jonathan, is there, you know, I thought it was interesting. I read a really good piece about how Dartmouth responded to this. They actually did what universities do. They taught, they had a symposium. They brought in different people with different viewpoints and they had a conversation and a dialogue about this. And to me, I wish that more institutions were responding yeah, I look, that I do way. think it's true. Like there, you should bring in speakers, you should hold symposia, not to glorify the martyrs, but to understand both sides. Now, again, I don't think there's both sides to racism or anti-Semitism, I don't. But on the other hand, I think we do need to listen to each other. In this moment- But we all don't need to understand sort of, you know, the circumstances of the Palestinian people. We need to understand the history. We need to understand kind of what the policies have been. And, you know, again, I think these issues are complex, yeah. but you have to kind of be able to appreciate and not justify. I'm not saying that, but appreciate and understand the circumstances of all these, I'm totally all, all the with parties you. And it gets involved. back to the earlier question about when your friend says, what do I say when I say I support Israel and yet they're bombed a refugee camp? You should ask, why does Hamas have a command center under a refugee camp? Like, let's try to understand that. So you're right, teaching, which is not just about kumbaya, but getting to the real facts, the real details, to understand the roots, to talk about how we, look, at the end of the day, like I said before, Israel will only have long-term peace and security if Palestinians also have dignity and equality. Palestinians will only have dignity and equality if Israelis have peace and security. These things have to go hand in hand. And I'll just say, by the way, I think Hamas is the most anti-Palestinian organization in the world. What they've done in the last few weeks has put the Palestinian people back, you know, decades. I mean, in ways you can't even imagine. And who, who benefits from that? And do you think Israel is playing into Hamas's hands in terms of their response? I'm not saying that they necessarily have a choice. I'm just posit oh, sorry, positing that, um, you know, that the number of civilians who are being killed, that they are banking on that turning well, the world against Israel. The fact, I mean, we know that Hamas doesn't care about its people. Hamas folks, Hamas leadership is on record as saying, that their job is not to protect the Palestinian people. Their job is to prosecute war against Israel. Literally, they're on record saying that. So yeah, I think it plays in their hands. The more of their civilians get killed, it helps their, their cause of martyrdom. Um, so th there's some truth to that. On the other hand, Israel needs to keep its citizens safe. And having a group on your border that says she goes to murder as many Jews as possible, like that's untenable for any country, whether it's ISIS, saying we're here to murder as many Yazidis as possible, or it's Al-Qaeda saying we're going to murder as many Americans as we can, or Hamas we're going to murder as many Jews as we can. No government would tolerate that. And that's why that's got to end. Look, Katie, speaking of ending, I'm, I got to go because I have another commitment, but it's good to talk to you. I know. I appreciate you giving this time. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan, anytime. for your time. Everyone, we were, having, we were having problems with the question section. I apologize, but I did get to some from social media. Be good, Katie. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. And thanks for watching, everyone. Okay, bye.